is the founder and CEO of Omland Lenses Limited, a broadcasting and media production company. She is the producer, host of the popular indigenous language talk show Huda Organa Extra and Nim Nollywood of Africa Magic. With a background in social work and mass communication, she is an advocate of Africans owning and telling their stories. Hence, her work in the media space. Her mission is to tell the African story in such a way that it changes the narratives of poverty and dependency. Stories that empowers Africa to be more. She is a great believer that Africans can truly turn the table in their favor by having strong media presence and by being globally minded in the economic space. She is also a strong voice for women. She believes in the power and the ability of women in impacting the society positively when given equal opportunities. She expresses this through a not-for-profit organization, Sheila Advantage, and also an online community, Divaco Tribe. She is the convener of the widely acclaimed conference Uzuko Uda Ogene, an annual conference that looks at the challenges facing the Southeast and how its people can become the solution they desire. May has over 18 years of entrepreneurial experience spanning over three industries, event, hospitality, fashion and media. She had a very eventful childhood which greatly impacts on her take on life. She strongly believes that you can be anything you want to be. Thus, a philosophy in life, if you're not invited, bring your own chair. And if there's no space for you on the table, build your own table. She is a homebody. Our best times are times spent with family. She loves to cook and decorate. An avid reader, a reasonable good writer and a fashion enthusiast. She is a wife and a mother. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me, Maurice Kyle, up on the scene. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Thank you. Please, can we help me move this? Move it to the yeah, side. I might not be as quiet as it <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. It must be one of the easiest things to do in the world, standing before two, two strangers. <laughs> and telling them how of a moron you have been. <laughs> so I'm not nervous at all. <laughs> oh dear Lord. <laughs> so please, I'll be calling for the slides. But first, let me say a big thank you to Fatima Werishi. Thank you, thank you for this honor, you and your wonderful team. I don't take this for granted. And to my boyfriend for life, my ride and ride. <laughs> thank you. And thank you all for coming out to hear us talk. So, the first slide, please. Yeah, that is me. <laughs> yeah, that one. <laughs> so, I am a TV producer. I also uh, host an indigenous language talk show. I actually have two shows on African Magic. I produce and host one, and then I produce, I just produce the other. I've always known I was going to be involved with TV as far back as when I was like eight. There's something about women on TV that have always pulled at me. Um, my first exposure to that was uh, Lola Alakija of Blessed Memory when she does her thing on NTA, 9 o'clock news. And then there was Onyeka Owen. When she came back, the first thing she did was present a uh, host, a present or something in Anambra State. And then I discovered Oprah. And back here in Nigeria again, there was Fumi Yonda and Wonder Woman Mo Abudu. Those women had always had impression on me. There's something so powerful about them. But when the opportunity came, like 40 years later to be part of that, of that industry, I was the most unprepared person for that. My passion and desire did not equal success in that space. And um, I actually found that in a very hard way. 
Next slide, please. So, what was the initial idea or project? Okay, the original plan, just like Pinky and the Brain, for some of you that are old enough to remember them, <laughs> the idea was to take over the world. <laughs> you know, create this beautiful, premium, indigenous talk show that can compete side by side with any talk show in English anywhere in the world, both in picture quality, audio, story, everything, content, and use it to not just tell your story the way you want to tell it, but also to use it to show your people who they truly are so we can all go out there and smash the world. And we actually did that to a large extent. Everybody that came in contact with our show or that experienced our show agreed that it was a beautiful one. When we, when we were still uh, recording the first season, the first 13 episode, African Magic launched the Igbo channel. So we, we took the, um, a short clip of that to go and meet the lady responsible for buying content for them, acquiring content. When she saw what we have, just a, a, a very short clip, she couldn't max her excitement. She, in fact, she on the spot acquired the program. When we launched, when we had our um, private screening, a few weeks before the show was uh, premiered on African Magic, and we invited some people in the industry, Obiem Elonye, all of us know Obiem Elonye, the great movie guy. He said something to us. He said, your show is going to be the best on that platform. And he was right. He said again, very soon, your show is going to be the, um, what's his name again? Larry King show for the Igbo community. That everybody that comes on your show is made. And he was serious. He wasn't sweet-talking us. But <laughs> that was in 2015. This is 2019. <laughs> what they all forgot to tell us is that we needed to run this thing like a business in order to be able to sustain it for impact. And that was the beginning of our sorrows. Next slide, please. Yeah. So Africa Magic did buy the show, the first 13 episodes, and they paid in hard currency, dollars. We were so right, we have hit the jackpot. <laughs> so, and the Igbo viewing community went crazy when the show came on air. Everybody on African Magic was like, who are these people? How were they able to do this? This is an Igbo show, but it's so international in this quality. We were in our zone. And based on the success of the show, a few weeks after it was premiered, they called us again to do a four-part Christmas special of the show that will run through the four weeks of December of that year, 2015. Of course, we knocked that one off the park. We have found it. We have it. It was so beautiful. We went all the way. And when we delivered, the overall channel head at that time, they said, she kept saying, who are these people? I need to meet these people. How are they doing this? And of course, what it meant is that the value for what we have has gone high. We demanded for more, and they paid. So we quickly put together a season two, this time around a 26 episode of the program, instead of 13. And um, we quickly run off to African Magic, and it was yet another dollar ring. But then, that was early 2016, recession. Dollar was getting scarce. But who cares? We have a dollar making baby. So we started spending. The company's money was our money. Our money was the company's money. Who owns the company? Us. <laughs> So, we needed a befitting office space for us and our staff. 
we are doing such an awesome job. So we need a matching lifestyle. So more spending spray. <laughs> then, but because we are not irresponsible people, we quickly put together another 26 episodes, now season three, and off again to our beloved African magic. And shocker number one, there are no more buying in dollars. Shocker number two, they cannot afford to buy now. What just happened? We have salaries to pay. We have rent to pay, both for the home and the office. We have overheads and, of course, those minor details like school fees, <laughs> feeding the children, clothing them, and those other obligations you have as adults. And let me remind you that at this point, we have systematically became a one-customer company. We have basically abandoned every other aspect of our business and everything we were doing before now to focus on this dollar-making child. So to call the long story short, they eventually took pity on us and bought our most expensive... I didn't tell you, that season three, we took it all the way. It was beautiful, the set, the costume, everything. We, we went an, an extra mile. So now our most expensive and most beautiful episode, uh, uh, season was bought for just a little bit tiny fraction, smallest part of what they have bought from us all this other time. So the spiral fall has begun. And then... Walked in 2017, the horror story went into full swing. Salaries were piling up. Landlords were calling. Some vendors we've engaged, hoping that by the time they pay, we will pay them and move on with our lives, were calling. At this point, when my phone rings, my heart skips like two steps. When a knock comes on my office door, I get very apprehensive. And then the staff members started leaving. For every one of them that walked into my office and say, Ma, I have to go. I can't afford to come to work again. I have found something else. Became a validation of me as a failure. <laughs> Forgive me. Can I have the next slide? Yes, next slide, please. So, I have gathered people's children <laughs> and I've exposed them to unnecessary hardship. I have let them down. They have lost confidence in me as a leader. And of course, we started selling things. We sold everything, including the cars until there was nothing else to sell. Mm. Then, at this point, we had to move ourselves to work mm. using taxis and Ubers. But we couldn't sustain this for a very long time. So it got to the point where we are pushed to taking public transport to work. Wow. That is the infamous yellow buses. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you something. Nobody in this world have the ability to make you feel as worthless as Lagos conductors <laughs> and their drivers. I can tell you that. <laughs> it was such a humiliating time in my life. Sometimes I get to the office, I am so sad. 
I am so drained, both physically and emotionally. I am so depressed that I couldn't do anything. And then there's another round of meeting them again on your way back. Then, by the last quarter of 2017, we couldn't even afford to keep our children in school. Of course, by that time, quick notice also came. And we were about to get, become homeless, which actually happened for three weeks. We couldn't afford to keep our children in school. And how do you, I can tell you this is the, a parent's worst nightmare. How do you go to your very brilliant children who love to go to school that they can't go again because mommy and daddy can't afford to keep them there? How do you begin to explain that to them? But I will tell you something else that is even more heartbreaking. When your child, who is obviously very hungry, comes to you and say, Mommy, I am hungry. And you have no freaking idea what to do or where to go. Because those are shorting in your face faster than you could knock at them. You're doing great. You're doing great. <laughs> you stop <up>. Yeah, please. <laughs> You see, one day, I was, middle of the night, everybody had gone to bed, and um, I was lying at the couch at the back of my living room, and I was quietly crying my heart out to God. I said to him, God, all I need is just one break. No matter how tiny I will take it, just one yes. Just one positive response. Because you see, at this point, we are falling so flat on our faces, and we still couldn't feel the ground. It was like an un unending abyss of darkness. And obviously, he heard. Because at this point, he inspired an idea in my husband. You know? We, he inspired a thought in my husband, which at the time seemed most unlikely. But because we didn't have any other thing to lose, and the worst thing that could have happened is another round of news. So we presented it. And lo and behold, it was accepted. And that was our break. Yeah. <laughs> the next slide. Yeah. So, what could I have done differently? Maybe stayed away from TV production, <laughs> stayed home like this very wise woman, eat popcorn and watch TV. It couldn't have gotten that bad. But of course, you know I'm joking. What could I have done differently? We could have listened to our environment, environment more intelligently. The Highest amount of dollars we received was in 2016, onset of 2016, the, uh, the, uh, the early 2016, and that was the onset of the recession. The least we could have done is to leave the money untouched, or a bulk of it, allow the value to come up, and invest it. But we didn't do that. And when we concluded the recording of the season one, we actually went to different media houses and we spoke with some brands. And they kept, the recurring question was, where, which local station are you airing on or which state? And that was our environment telling us, go buy airtime and sell adverse lots, attract sponsors and continue. But no, we have our African magic, so we are cool. What else could we have done differently? the way we hired. We were essentially bringing inexperienced people and training them to do basically the things we could do. Rather than employing people with skill, 
that could come in and tell us how to do what we are doing better and how to monetize what we already have. We could have done that. Another thing we could have done differently was our structure. In fact, we didn't have any structure, by the way. No business, no financial, nothing. We had no business plan. We had no marketing plan. Itoro even had projection. We had nothing like that. What is projection again? <laughs> Where are you projecting to? You know? We didn't have any of that. Because it, what we realized that if you are doing business without, if you are doing business and you are not marketing, you are just enjoying a hobby. My Igbo people say that, th there's a saying that goes, a few man alone, where? loosely translated, a good product sells itself. It's a big lie. <laughs> we, we, a good product could only make selling easy. You know? We, we, we created a beautiful content and sat down pretty, expecting the ripe cherries to start dropping on our laps. And it doesn't happen in real life. And if we have had a better financial structure, what could have happened is that we would have been able to see where the money is in what we are doing, able to track our, manage our money, track it, and possibly multiply it. But we don't do all that. But we are doing that now. So, the next slide. Oh, we are here already. What did I learn? One of the best things I took away from coming out of that very dark season of our lives was that no failure is final. That there's nothing I can't come out of, no matter how low I had fallen, so long as I don't give up. I also learned I, that to go far in business, or anything in life, I need a mentor. I need somebody who had gone ahead of me, who could easily point out to me the pitfalls that are ahead. I also learned that to grow a business and be able to create the kind of impact that we desired, we need a strong team. A team of skillful people, of high net people, people whose experiences skills, knowledge, and connections, we complement our areas of weaknesses. And these have become our culture now. Another thing I learned from that experience is that when you go in to negotiate for any job, for any business, you don't negotiate based on how empty your stomach is or how hungry you are. You negotiate based on the value you are bringing in. Because in 2017, we worked harder than we have ever worked in our lives. We were working, we were, we were machines. You know, we, we, because what happened was we were taking up everything, even those things we neglected to do before. We were producing events, we were do, producing documentary for people, and we were collecting peanuts because we were hungry. And people were taking advantage of that. And there's something about life. What you leave yourself open to, you keep attracting. You keep attracting. They were just everywhere, vultures. <laughs> you know? So some jobs that we couldn't have touched for like 5 million, we were taking them for 1.5 million. Then what will happen is midway into the job, the money has finished. Then those people that are ready to pay you peanuts are the people that demand for your soul. So we were doing these jobs with our blood. Sometimes we leave the house on Tuesday. I don't see my house or my children again till Thursday. Of course, my husband won't come back till like Sunday. And we couldn't even feed. We were all over the place. Until the day we said, no more. We said, we'll rather use that time. This, we sit down, this is how much it's going to take to do this job, and this is the fraction on top of it. If they can't afford to pay, we'll rather sit home and sleep. Then when we wake up, we play with our children. It will be more productive. Because as you are running all over time, you can't even stop to think. You are just stretching yourself and entering into more debt. Because you will still contract people you cannot pay because what they paid you is not enough to pay anybody.
Then, another thing I learned, which will be the last but the most important thing I learned, is how strong I am. It's ironic, but my failure exposed more of my strength than my weaknesses to me. I suddenly realized how smart, how intelligent, how undefeatable I can actually be. <laughs> when it got to the point where we couldn't afford to pay people to do stuff, I see myself doing things that I thought were way over my head. And I was doing them well. I was so proud of myself. Now I can stand and say, introduce myself as a TV host. I was quite silly about hosting anything. I would rather walk from the shadows and push other people to interpret my dream and vision because I was scared. I was scared of failing. But when the presenter we had then walked out because we couldn't retain her, I had two options. Either to keep hiding under my excuses and let the vision die, or step out into the light at the risk of my mistakes being amplified and being discussed by the world, at the risk of me failing. But I took that option, and then I realized something, that I could actually push more people forward by just stepping forward. So, you can rightly say that failure made me more dangerous. Yeah. Thank you very much. Awesome. Oh my. <laughs> I, I, like, I like that ending. It's like, it's like failure, you don't buy markets. You know? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now we'll take questions. We'll take questions. I'm sure you're... Um, so if you have a question, just put up your hand. We'll take the first two. Do we have any? Okay. Okay, um, good afternoon. Good evening, sorry, it's already seven. Um, my question is actually, I discovered um, your life, the movement of your life is kind of an inverse loop this way. So more or less like you've been up, you came down, then you came up again. So basically, I want to come to that point where you actually had this flow of not having what you wanted, you came down. Now, how were you able to manage your value at that place? Because most persons, most entrepreneurs, in fact, many people, most times when you get down, the ability to be able to hold your value that time matters a lot. Because you, you just said it that the third, I think, was it your third series, was sold at any price. So how can you be able to, why didn't you sell it at the same price then? Or was it because you were so wanting to do something at that time? What was the, what was the drive about? Okay. I was selling it at the lowest price was because we gave them all the control by not having other options, and which was the major mistake, one of the major mistakes we made. You, you, you can't begin to regulate the price if there is no competition. We, and we actually did that. We could have had other ways that we could have created to monetize what we are. So if they said, this is what we are going to do it, we can comfortably say, say thank you, nice doing business with you, bye, and we are off. But we, at that time, we couldn't afford to do that. I don't think that was a question of value. I think that was a question of necessity. It wasn't a value thing. OK, good evening. Thank you for your, your in fact, your, your strength. Thank you. I just want to ask, when you had the money, the dollars coming, why did it cross your mind to invest maybe in property, something you can get back Did you from? listen to me? No. <laughs> <laughs> I know you talked why about, yes, you talked about <laughs> selling. Eh? You talked about selling. You talked about having a paying rent. You talked about staying in a house, you're paying rent. At that time, you had dollars coming in. You didn't think about buying a property. That was so, my know. F.U. Okay. 
<laughs> but when when you said you're going to make some that was when it. you said you you what's your land i didn't see you talking about okay now you've landed but i you addressed that I, I addressed that i said we could have done that thank you yeah. yes 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 you, you know the thing about this thing is <laughs> It's very easy for you when you're right there. To, you, see, <laughs> see, fucking up makes you forget. Failing makes you forget. It's like, you know, you know when we were in class back in that time, when a teacher asks a question. Yeah, exactly. I said that, yeah. Hey, that she was has, the major she thing I came out she with. She has notes right here. Please put your hands together for her. <laughs> We've referenced it. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.